Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1972 Italian giallo film, Who Saw Her Die? And when I watched this, I watched it on the Blu-ray put out by Arrow Video. Uh, looks good. It's a good, clean-looking version. And uh, this is a pretty good film. I didn't know what to expect with a lot of the giallo films I'm seeing for the first time, like this one. I kind of go in just expecting I'll enjoy it enough because I haven't come across that many giallo films that I've been like, I hate that. Um, so it, I expect a certain degree of happiness with the film, but with this one, it went a little bit higher for me and I really, really did enjoy it. I think it's a well done film and, uh, yeah, excited to talk about it here. So, like I said, from 1972, Who Saw Her Die was directed by Aldo Lotto, who also did Short Night of Glass Dolls, which I like a lot. Um, so he now has two Giallo films I've seen that I really enjoyed. I also have a review for Short, Short Night of Glass Dolls on my channel that you can check out. In addition to an entire playlist of just a bunch of Giallo reviews, I think this is my 49th review, Giallo review to add to that. So just saying. Uh, he also did The Humanoid, Circle of Fear, and Dark Friday, just to name a few of the horror-ish films. Uh, this was written by Francesco Barilli, who also did Sacrifice, Hotel Fear, and The Perfume of the Lady in Black, which I also have a review for on my channel. You can check that out. And Massimo Diavac, who wrote scripts for Dark Purpose, The Labyrinth of Sex, So Sweet, So Perverse, which I also have a review for on my channel, uh, and Sacrifice. Uh, this stars, as you may know or not know, uh, George Lazenby as Franco, the main character. Now, may, some people may say, oh, George Lazenby, he was a Bond. Very short-lived, but he was James Bond for one film, and that was On Her Majesty's Secret Service. I'm a huge James Bond fan, by the way. I have almost every James Bond film back in my collection over here. Uh, it's even further over, but... Yeah, uh, love it. So when I saw uh, Lazenby was in this, I was like, oh, a Bond. How cool. Uh, Lazenby was also in such stuff as Eyes of the Beholder, The Evil Inside Me, and Gettysburg, just to name some of the bigger ones. Uh, the score by this is by Ennio Morricone, who, if you know Giallo and you're familiar with the music, Ennio Morricone does the best of the best score-wise. I think he did a really good job on this one. <laughs> the only thing is that that main theme song, the one that mainly comes up when someone is going to get killed or someone is potentially going to get killed, uh, really gets annoying kind of fast, in my opinion, uh, especially when it's on the main menu of the Blu-ray and they just keep playing that song on loop. If you just let it go, it will drive you freaking insane. But I think the song is very well constructed and does exactly what it's supposed to do, which is kind of build up tension, build up an unsettling feeling, because it is a very unsettling song with kind of like the kids singing that's done on like an echo loop. Um, it sounds messed up, uh, very much so. So he did a good job with that. This film was also titled The Child, which I think Who Saw Her Die is a better title than The Child, so I'm glad to call it that instead. It's kind of an odd choice to start the film with no music or anything showing this kind of snowy ski resort town, which is where it takes place, but I don't know what the purpose of that was. Like, I, I understand that you're showing, like, a beautiful setting, and maybe that was kind of the main purpose of opening it that way, but to have no music at all just felt like a really, really odd choice to me. I, I don't know why. It didn't look super realistic, but the murder of Nicole, the very first murder that happens with the girl who was sledding and then gets grabbed by the veiled killer and then is beaten in the head with a rock, it doesn't look it because the, the kill didn't look that realistic, but it is a brutal kill if you really consider what's going on there within the story. That is really, really pretty disturbing and brutal. So it is a good way to kind of set up the film, in my opinion. Interesting idea to show the killer's POV through that black pattern veil. Now, the other thing to consider, though, is that it's not always just the killer's POV through that veil, because when the body of Nicole is then found, you see that veil as well. Um, so they use it a little bit extra, but I think it's mainly meant to kind of uh, signify the killer's point of view. Um, and I like that touch. I really do. You know, shooting the camera right through that veil 
Very, very cool. And the pattern is very discernible so that whenever you see it, you're you know, your mind goes right back to, oh, okay, this is the veil the killer was wearing. Also interesting to show the cold case file for Nicole's murder during the opening credits. I thought that was a really interesting way to do opening credits. I've not seen any other films, at least not from this time period, do that, as they're just kind of flipping the pages of the cold case file. Uh, very cool, very great way to start things, and I think it sets it up to show you this is a cold case at this point where we're taking the story to start from. Introduction of an early red herring with Philip, who or Philippe, who says he cut his face while he was fencing. He shows up to talk to Franco and Kuman in the very beginning, and he's got that very uh, discernible uh, red mark on his face, and he's like, "Oh, I was fencing this morning, and I just got uh, just got nicked." So that's obviously supposed to be there to implant itself into the mind of the audience to make them a bit suspicious of him immediately because the murder had literally just happened so you're looking for suspects in a sense and it seems very suspicious that they would point that out and focus on it so much but that's what they do with giallo obviously they like to throw out a lot of red herrings and they do throw out a good amount in this also a red herring is kuman who acts like an unbelievable creep when he's at franco's place and um Roberta is there and she's looking at photos of her mother with the projector and he's just like ogling the photos of her mother Elizabeth but then also like interacting with her in a very creepy way if you know what I mean uh and I guarantee that that's just put in there as a way to kind of cast suspicion on him as well red herring once again uh so yeah I, I think it works because I was immediately like, there is something not right with this guy. Now, they don't, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't revisit any sort of activity like that or any personality traits like that for Kuman. It's just a one-time thing, so I, I guarantee it wasn't really supposed to be like a part of his character or personality. It was just supposed to be red herring for the most part. The echoing children singing... When shot, uh, yeah, sorry, I already talked about this. It, it does bear repeating, though. Very unsettling mu music with the kids singing, and it's just, like, on repeat. Um, so, Franco just leaves his kid unsupervised so he can bone Gabriella, who really doesn't show up again in the film, at least not in any sort of meaningful way. Uh, you just know that there's a setup for Roberto's demise at this point, because... Why else would they be making a point of showing him, you know, going to have sex? Unless there's something important about his relationship with Roberta, or I'm sorry, Gabriella, which there isn't. And obviously there's not anything all that important about his relationship with R Roberta, his own daughter, because he just leaves her like that, which is weird. Uh, but yeah, you, you do see it coming, especially when you know you're watching a Giallo film here, because that's kind of how these setups are for the most part is just, here it comes. A, a unaccompanied minor, uh, although she was around her friends, so she should have been fine for a little bit. Uh, you gotta love the transition from the killer work, walking up to Roberta to the hanging meat. Obviously, kind of a, a statement of her being killed and her becoming dead meat without actually showing it happening. So that really is an interesting way to kind of do that, to not have to show the brutality of it, but give you the idea of the brutality of it, that she has been reduced to a, to meat, to a corpse. So I think that was, it worked, it worked, it worked well. It's pretty creepy when you see all the people staring blank and emotionless at Roberta's floating body when her body is found. I don't know what the reasoning for that was, but I think maybe it could have been some sort of, um, some sort of indicator of kind of how how emotionless and blank society is when things like this actually happen and how they're kind of like cold to it. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but, um, you know, maybe there was something there. It would just seemed like a weird, creepy moment, though. Just all those people st standing there staring at a dead body with like no emotion whatsoever. Just like, oh, there it is. Dead body. Cool to see glass blowing featured in this film. Uh, that's just a little side note for me personally because I think glass blowing is an amazing, fascinating art. And when you have just kind of like interesting little things thrown into Giallo films, which happens a lot, uh, I thought this was a really cool kind of interesting little bit to throw in there. That's when 
Franco goes to talk to the father of the girl who he finds out was murdered um, in the same town, kind of in the same way. Um, he's a glass blower, so I just like that. Uh, I think Franco messed up <laughs> when he starts out outwardly accusing. I'm gonna mess up this this name. Banya Banayuti Banayuti, the guy with the glasses and all the birds. Um, he immediately just starts like talking about him as a child molester and accusing him and getting pretty aggressive about it. I mean, obviously he was there to try and get information on the previous murder, but that's not the way to come at someone if you're trying to get information. You know, obviously at that point for the audience, it seems like he's potentially a suspect, probably for Franco as well at that point, but if he was really looking to just like get the information, he would have gone about it a much more, you know, even keel way to try and pull that info out, but he really had a wall put up immediately when he started coming at him so aggressively like that. But, you know, he was distraught, all that stuff. It makes sense. He's lashing out. Um, they did fake me out with the maid cleaning the bathroom scene. When Elizabeth is by herself, well, we think by herself, but then Kuman shows up. Uh, when Elizabeth is by herself in that apartment, at least initially, and then you think that they're kind of setting it up because they're the gloved hands and the water's being run and she's kind of creeping around the house trying to figure out what's going on. And then all of a sudden, oh no, it's just the maid. And she was just going to clean the bathroom. Uh, they got me on that one. I really thought Elizabeth was about to get killed at that point. Um, it de it definitely felt like a typical kind of setup for the killer to kill someone. So um, good job on that. They got me on that one. Because there are plenty of Giallo films where that's the same type of setup. And here we go. Ginevra telling Franco she needs to tell him something, but she she'd tell him that night instead of right then sealed her fate as you know if you've seen enough giallo if someone says that they have information but they can't say it right then and they'll tell later they're dead they will be dead very soon every giallo film i've ever seen cannot think of any uh exceptions to it every time someone says i have information but i'll tell you later they're getting it for sure and that's what happens to ginevra how was Ginevra killed in a theater filled with people, though? That's one of the big things. The fact that the killer comes in and strangles her to death. Uh, I question why there was so much blood coming out of her mouth, but, I mean, it looked good. Uh, sits behind her when there are... They even show there are tons of people in that theater. Just sits behind her, chokes her to death. I don't understand how that happened. That's a very um, unrealistic thing to throw in the film, but, hey, it's Giallo. Giallo does a lot of that type of stuff. It's fine, but I have to point it out. I love the way they shot the stabbing of Baniuti, uh, the guy with the birds again and the glasses. Really great way that they shot that, how they show they show like the camera close-up of the gloved hand picking the knife up and then kind of like following as the gloved hand has the knife and then all the way to like the stabbing and then like the close-up and the further back of the actual stabbing. Great intense scene. I think it adds so much to it and the way they blend the music into it as well. Great intense scene. I really enjoyed that one. Uh, it slightly does hark harken back to the scenes with the pigeons in the beginning too though because if you notice in the beginning of the film they show twice all these pigeons kind of like flying around and swirling around a guy who I think was feeding them. I'm, I'm not 100% sure but the fact that all the birds are out after Bunny O.T., uh, sorry, messed up his name again, how his, uh, all his birds were out after he was killed, and it's just a cool scene where it's like the shot from further out of his dead body laying there with the birds just kind of flying all around, and that harkens back, I think, to those pigeon moments, which is very interesting. Just a good kind of like visual callback, in my opinion. Uh, the camera work in the abandoned building when Franco's being followed is particularly amazing. That camera work looks really, really cool, especially when they first show that kind of longer shot of Franco kind of like walking through. It just looks so cool uh, and frames things really, really well, especially this shot from above that pans up. It's like shooting from above showing Franco walking and then he's being followed by someone and then it pans up 
and you see that Seraph Seraphian, yeah, Seraphian is standing on the level above him, like looking down, watching. Just such cool camera work. It's so engaging. It's so good. In general, the camera work, cinematography, directing in this film, really, really good, in my opinion. Loved it. Odd that Francois watches uh, what amounts to porn videos with his mother in it uh, when he was showing that to Franco. I mean, I understand he was kind of watching those to get clues to kind of solve what happened to his mother, who the killer was. But at the same time, like, he doesn't need to watch him numerous times. He can also just set it up and let Franco watch it because he's literally, like, watching porn with his mother in it. So just another, another weird thing in a Giallo film. Not surprising. I like how Seraphian's body is slowly revealed by the door creaking open and uh, him kind of stabbed to the door. That was when Franco was sneaking into that house and then all of a sudden the door behind him just kind of like creaks open and Seraphian's like hanging from the door because he's been stabbed through. Cool reveal for the body. I really enjoyed that. The frantic camera movements when Elizabeth is being pursued helps increase the tense moments. That's something that gets used a lot, especially in these Giallo films where, you know, the killer's coming after someone and they do a lot of kind of like rough movements with the camera. I think that kind of helps to translate the intensity of the moment and, and the mood and what's going on there. And it just really does increase in the intensity for, for the audience. So it works. Man, Father Sh James went down in a blaze of glory, if you get the joke. Um, he, he gets set on fire and then goes flying out the window. I don't understand why they kept sh like re-showing him falling a certain amount. It, it did get a little repetitive and weird. But then the moment where like he finally falls all the way and that's just kind of like thud. And you're just like, yep, burning body. That was a cool moment. I enjoyed that. The ending with Kuman saying Father James was an imposter could be a way to deflect backlash akin to what Lucio Fulci's Don't Torture a Duckling ended up generating. This is just a speculation on my part. Or it could have been a statement about false religious figures because obviously Father James was the killer in this situation, but then that tacked on thing at the end where Kuman's like, oh, they said that Father James was an imposter. He wasn't even a priest. I don't, I'm wondering if the reasoning for that was to say uh, you never really know who you're following from a religious figure standpoint and they could be a total false prophet because obviously Father James was very involved in that church and very involved in the community um, or if it was a situation where Aldo Lotto just kind of wanted that thrown in there or one of the script writers in order to deflect the uh, ire that it would draw from people like the film by Fulci, Don't Torture a Duckling did, who who had a killer priest in it and got a lot of flack, a lot of flack for that. So I don't know if that was their way to do it, to be like, oh, you might be pissed off right now because it was Father James, but guess what? Here's our way out of it. It wasn't that he wasn't actually a religious figure. He was an imposter. So I don't know. You can let me know your thoughts in the comments. Just a speculation on my part. Nice directing and cinematography, lots of interesting panning shots. That's one of the things with a lot of the uh, Giallo films of this time period, the Italian ones, is that they typically have very engaging camera work, and that includes a lot of very interesting panning shots, very interesting ways of moving with characters, around characters, shooting through objects to uh, show characters, and there's a lot of that great camera work in this. They cover a lot of ground in the city, and they use buildings to frame shots in very interesting ways. This is another thing that I find in Giallo films a lot that I love, is really good use of the cityscape and the architecture, and it's beautiful. It's fascinating, and it's beautiful, and whenever they're kind of using the structure of the building, like they do a good amount in this film, but most, uh, probably the best example being like I was talking about that abandoned building that Franco walks into, like, they literally use the structure to, like, frame the shot of Franco walking in it. Just very, very interesting. Very cool looking. And I always love that in Giallo films. So, that's all I have to say about Who Saw Her Die. Like I said, I enjoyed this one. It's not the best, but it is good. So, out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it a very solid three and a half star rating. I enjoyed this one. 
Would love to hear your thoughts on it, though. Go ahead and put it in the comments. Love it, hate it in the middle, or just if you want to talk about Giallo in general. Also, do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe button if you're not already subscribed. If you are already, thank you very much. It helps motivate me to keep going. If you're not, please do it. Uh, it's painless, costs you nothing, literally takes a second, and it means a lot to me. Like I said, it keeps me motivated whenever I see new people subscribing. Also hit the notification bell button because then that way you'll know whenever I'm putting up new videos, whether it's one of these spoiler-filled analysis videos or uh, reviews or one of my no-spoiler reviews or unboxing videos, haul videos, any of that stuff. But regardless, I thank you for taking your time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.